thinks of himself as a, um, a poetic, romantic realist. He, I mean, he paints realistic subject matter, but what he puts into it is, is the contents of his soul and his heart. I mean, everything he does, he puts his heart and soul into it. To me, he's, a, he's an inspiration. He's one of these artists. A lot of artists like to work together, paint together, because we feed off of each other. And boy, he's one guy you can really feed off of. He always has this energy, and it radiates from him to you. I mean, uh, we used to draw it just from, he'd come up and start talking to you, and, and you just feel the energy coming. And it always goes into your work. A natural um, ab ability for Zen he understands that each contains each each thing contains its opposite, and he uh, he can impart that almost like a Zen cone. It is absolutely fantastic. I think that what what probably makes Gary Pruner uh, so exceptional is that he was ahead of his time. He's a great colorist. Uh, his ideas were unusual. The mixed metaphor ideas that he had uh, startled people a lot. Everyone was talking about color theory and Gary Pruner, and I still look at Gary like kind of like a superstar kind of, you know, role model type of person. at a very young age of, of drawing things and, and getting praise and uh, total support from my family and from my uncle and uh, all my uncles and everyone knew Gary was going to be an artist and a teacher. All the way through high school I was um, real avarice about art. I, I loved it. And I was just very lucky. I had people who were, were artists who lived art, who loved it, they taught it. They made friends with me. They always were going to my parents and asking them if I could come and spend the summer with them. I would got to go to uh, California College of Arts and Crafts, and I had uh, people like Robert Bechtel and uh, Stephen Korn and uh, uh, oh, a couple other very top, and they were real young as teachers, and it was real, real neat. Because, I mean, here these guys grew up to be very famous, and they were my teachers, you know. By the time I started my serious work, I started out by saying, I want to be able to do what my mind thinks it can do. If I think up something, I want to have the skills to do it. Arts and Crafts was, was a great experience. And uh, when I got to Sac State, I started doing more abstract stuff. I remember Irving Marcus said to me once, he says, you'll know what painting's about after you paint 100 miles of paintings. And, and, and I thought of that literally how much canvas that would take and how much cost that would take until one day I realized that, that it wasn't so much in the material sense of 100 miles but that pretty soon that you um, in starting a painting you were starting to paint at the end of the painting rather than at the beginning of the painting that you had fixed in your mind this purpose of the whole painting and that you weren't as worried about the starting point of it and should everything be, because it seemed like those things unfolded very naturally. You, know, you find out there's some things that just come pretty fluid to you, pretty easily to you. You have insights that seem might be a culmination of other people have taught you, but they must have fit you because they seem to be uh, things that pour right out of you easily. This painting is uh, named Banana Split. It's uh, one of the uh, oldest paintings I have to show you. Um, it, it's when I was first going away to college. I was obviously influenced by William de Kooning. And, uh, but I st it's strange that things that de Kooning did I, and that I admired are things that I must have instinctually inside me because I use them all the time. Number one, the color. I just love the, the boldness of the color and, and the fluidity of the paint. Um, the idea of overlapping planes that one color goes in front of and behind and then all of a sudden um, an edge turns to a line. All of a sudden here's a mass and the mass turns to a line. Uh, uh, directional strokes between diagonals and verticals. All those things are things that 
that de Kooning um, had put in his painting and of course uh, I imitated it uh, as best I could. Uh, I loved, <clears throat> for the longest time, I loved pink and green together. They were such uh, snotty uh, colors uh, for the time and uh, um, <clears throat> were taboo colors to use, but I, I really used them. You can also see that I had poured different kinds of uh, shellacs and other kinds of things building up the surface. So it, it isn't real smooth. It has a, has a slight texture to it. This is an oil painting uh, that uh, was pulled from a series where I put uh, contradictions and uh, opposites together. It's called uh, Bucolic McCall's, <clears throat> indicating uh, the high and the low of, of imagery because there's a, a frog's eye, there's birds in it, uh, a ram's um, a horn, um, pond scum is that, that green stuff floating in the upper right hand corner. And uh, if, you, if you look real carefully, the, the figure on the left side with the bird and the frog and, and all the things inside of it, that's a, a gal dressed up in a bikini. The idea was to put uh, icons of American culture inside, that the lettering uh, doesn't spell anything, but it indicates that there's something inside. And that we see things so totally out of scale. The peas in the picture are, as, are, are much larger than they are in real life. And that, that helps the idea of uh, that's juxtaposing things that are um, uh, making everything equal, making everything the same. Many, many years ago when I started discovering what kinds of things I was interested in, um, as opposed to things I had been taught, uh, it was um, obviously color. This is an example of a painting where I tried to play with, uh, again, there's a figure in there, uh, not, not the Japanese figure, but, but there's another figure with a bikini bathing suit. And uh, uh, all these things uh, that she's filled with in terms of uh, uh, shapes and subject matter all uh, lent themselves to investigation of color. On the right hand side, there's a uh, I just took the, the flying weedies flakes and uh, <clears throat> turned them into to bright colors in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, very luminous uh, yellow greens through um, turquoise and, and blues. And the colors behind it obviously being all reds, pinks, and, and, um, and yellows in the backside. Again, just trying to get the aura of the whole thing. Here, the picture is predominantly all reds. And so the green things, um, if you squint down, the green things glow mostly. And then there, here's a, spatially, here's a koi fish coming in off of uh, the lower left corner. The, the reason for all those is just to, to make it seem like it's something you hadn't seen before, something you know, it, that you couldn't predict, something a little bit um, catches you off guard. This is a watercolor. And uh, during this watercolor series, I put combinations of things in a little bit more inventive way and again, push the color quite a bit. But pre this one's called presaging. And presaging is just the idea of foreseeing what's, uh, what's coming uh, in the future. And of course, animals have this sense, this instinctual sense to do that. So I also wanted to indicate the amount of the wind or or anything, and that's what the fish are symbolizing, that they're not necessarily in the water, but they are um, the direction and the flow of the wind and the air. Gary's early paintings from the 70s, and in that sense, it's very typical, I think, of the photorealistic stuff. Now, if you ever run into Gary, don't tell him that you're saying you're a photorealist, because he will say, I am not a photorealist. I think he calls himself a poetic realist. But the mechanics of the painting technique itself involves the idea of photorealism as we discussed it. This is a goose that shows up fairly typically in Gary's works. He likes to paint geese, he likes to paint bears, he likes to paint koi fish and cheetahs sometimes. But a goose colored in no way that we've ever seen it before. Can you sense that little surface treatment right there? Can you see that? You can also see it right up here. You see it right there? That's that feathering technique. 
that Gary puts in so many of his paintings. Sure. But yeah, then is the psychedelic color scheme in here? Sure, look at the face on hanging. It looks like he just dipped his head in a bucket of paint here. Yes? And then the curious juxtaposition besides this now, they're emerging out of a background of what looks to me like Reese's Pieces or Skittles. Yes, and those weird little oriental green peas you eat. Yeah? So here, again, in a pop art way, he's taking typical everyday items. In some case, we can even identify them as brand name items. There's the pop art part. The psychedelic color scheme is here. The curious juxtaposition of surrealism is here. And he's painting these from collages, from photographic collages that he's put together himself. There's the photorealistic technique. All artists have something to say, whether it be uh, political, social, or something else and and I think there's a, a deeper understanding that you have to have when you look at a Gary Pruner painting generally speaking oh sure you know when you see uh, his uh, koi that is koi but there's also something else that's really brilliant in what he's able to uh, depict when he does paint the koi Many art teachers uh, get such pressure on them uh, by the students to learn to paint and they want to paint a picture. You didn't do that with Gary Pruner. Uh, Gary Pruner made you learn the fundamentals, whether it be watercolor or oil, and there would be weeks and weeks and weeks where you just did color wheel or whatever else. You learned the fundamentals. Uh, much like I think the, uh, the uh, Chinese and the Japanese who would just paint squares for two years to learn how to paint a, paint a square. And uh, I think that's really what was fascinating about Gary. So those that lasted through that, who would do all the exercises, uh, learned a lot more than those that wanted to uh, just learn uh, to make a, a tree in a house or whatever. Uh, and uh, the idea I think that Gary had was that, look, I'll teach you the fundamentals. You go out and find your own voice. He's a great teacher. I saw his art actually before I saw him and loved his art. Um, he's, uh, he's very giving and he makes you want to learn more. I don't know, I don't know how to say how much I learned from him because it was a tremendous amount. He didn't try to um, direct you his way. He always would, lots of times he would ask, uh, well, what direction would you like to go or what's your idea and he would try to help you develop it. He pushed you to look for what was within you and what you wanted to state and then he helped you in that direction but you had to find it yourself. Just like a Zen master would give you the cone and you must meditate and figure that out. He's important to this community. He is a fixture here. A fixture as a teacher and as a painter. There's really nothing else I can say. Sometimes you absolutely lose yourself and you really are the transcriber between the thought and the painting. That it's not you, it's some other thing that you've taught to take over. And sometimes I go, wow, I've been standing here for 14 hours and I got this done and I don't remember much about it. You know, I don't know how I did. In fact, sometimes it scares me so bad. Those paintings are right over here, and I'm looking at them while I'm painting, like like I'm going to get it again. And and it really is, um, uh, in in terms of uh, uh, the Japanese thoughts, it, it is that meditation. That that that's why you get your paint set up. That's why there are rituals you go through because they're getting you ready to go into the subconscious interaction between things. When an artist paints something that's new to us and becomes original, it gives us an original experience. We see something that's wow. And, and the artist gets good enough that almost every painting that they paint arrives at that, at that point. It's got to have that set of dynamics to it, that, that it lures you in. It, it, it compels you, relaxes you, and yet, you know, gives you the drama that, that, that draws us, sucks you in.